because session two is going to be super exciting. I'm therefore going to call. It's, it's, it's very pleasant, eloquent, extremely knowledgeable and wise moderator. I will introduce her and then I will welcome her. She is a voracious reader and she is the teacher of young forming minds from LKG to college over 24 years. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Ms. Nusaratunnisa Begum. As to the author, I saw the faces when the Intellect Club read out the passage. I knew you felt it. You felt it here in the pit of your stomach, boys, girls alike. You couldn't believe it. I heard the gasps. I was sitting there with you. Shouldn't we know something more about somebody who wrote something that is so profound and so deeply affecting and so real? Well, she is an award-winning conservation biologist. Small wonder. She heads conservation and policy at Bombay Natural History Society. Uh, she's been chosen for the Australia-India Youth Dialogue and for the Legislative Fellows Program organized by the U.S. Department of State for Legislative and Policy Development in, two, in 2007. She was awarded by the Sanctuary Nature Foundation for her service to wildlife. Let's put our hands together for the one and only Neha Sinha. It's an honor and a pleasure to host you. Before we get into the session, there's something I need to share with you. It's a little poem I wrote when I was writing an introduction for her. I thought this might be more apt. The roar of the tiger, fangs of snakes, the charge of an elephant that the ground shakes. The eyes of the peacock as it fans out its tail. Scorpions skittering, making hearts quail. Why are some animals scary? Pray, do tell. Aren't we all animals? Yes, you and me as well. Or maybe it is that they fascinate you so. In either case, let's meet them closer through Neha, for she knows. In 2021, she published her first book, Wild and Willful, tales of 15 iconic Indian species whom we are going to meet up close and personal, understand them, love them, and treat them right because we are all part of the same biome. Over to you, ladies. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Dr. CLM Shisha OMR School for this literary event. I have with me Neha Sinha, and we are going to discuss her book, Wild and Willful. What shall I tell you about Wild and Willful? I was given this book uh, about one week ago to read because I was going to discuss it. And I kept procrastinating. I said, book on animals. I was more into the genre of suspense. But then I had to discuss it, so I started to read it around 9 p.m. on Friday. It became 10, I was still reading it. It became 11, my husband came to check on me and said, what is it, Jeffrey Archer, Clive Kassler, Robin Cook? I said, no, Neha Sinha. That interesting was this book. So Neha, I'm interested and intrigued to know what is it that triggered you to write this book? Thank you so much, first of all. Such an honor to be here with young minds. And I must say that Wild and Willful is a book for adults. And you guys are so smart that you've enjoyed this book and loved it. Uh, it means you're smarter than I was when I was your age. Um, thank you, ma'am, for that. Um, I wrote Wild and Willful because we don't know enough about our Indian species. When I was growing up, I knew about Yellowstone National Park in the United States. I knew about the grizzly bears of Canada. 
But I didn't know about the sloth bears of India. I knew about the jungle book, but that's about it. And I'm passionate about bringing what we have in India for all of us. And therefore, in this book, you have the animals that maybe you've heard of, like tigers and leopards and elephants. But you also have animals that maybe we don't like that much or maybe are not so famous, such as cobras and king cobras and butterfly species that are found in particular parts of India. And the point I'm trying to make really is that India is a democracy. It has its human citizens, but it also has the non-humans. And this is living, breathing, beautiful, uh, absolute variety of wildlife that we have. And I would love for people to know a bit more about what they need so that we can plan for them as well. That's the reason behind Wild and Willful. OK. What are the three words that you would choose to describe your book and why? So the first word I would use would be Indian, as I said. And I'd just like to um, read out why I'm using that word, Indian. So this is about the great Indian bustard. It's a bird that maybe not all of us have heard about, but it's a bird that's found in India. It's one of the biggest, heaviest flying birds on Earth. It's about 20 kilos. It lives in the desert in Thar um, and in Kutch in Rajasthan and Gujarat. It is a bird that was found all over India, which is why it used to be called the great Indian bustard. And today it's hanging by a thread. This is a bird that's almost extinct, just a hundred left in the whole world. So about maybe a hundred in India, maybe about 20 in Pakistan, but we are not sure. And because this is a bird that's named after us, and it's a bird that deserves to live, um, I wanted to write about uh, this Indian citizen. I think it's also a citizen just like us. So great Indian bustards are solitary birds. Their nests are prone to attack from other animals. The other great solitary animals are animals like the tiger. And tigers hunt and raise their cubs alone. And the great Indian bustard, like the tiger, is a K-selected species. This means that they're large-bodied, so it's a big animal, and it reproduces quite slowly. So these animals do not breed like rodents or rats, and they cannot breed within short time periods. This makes their natural population growth very slow, and it also means that the loss of a few individuals is a huge setback for the entire population. If the GIB or the Great Indian Bustard is barely known, it means that it would not be mourned when it dies. Like the Great Indian Bustard, many other little known birds are dying without songs written for them. We regard evolution so highly, saying it is that only the fittest that will survive. At first glance, it seems that evolution has left birds like the great Indian bustard behind. But is it evolution or just the lack of our vision? When we see the desert, the Marubhumi, stretched out in front of us, we see a dust bowl, undesirables, a crown of thorns, we see heat and sand and thorns and grit. And then we think that we should flood this place with water and we should grow crops there. The great Indian bustard was adapted for a life of heat and dust and sand and grit and we should respect it for that. The mind's eye has already made a fossil of a bird that's still living. And the point again is that we still have this bird amongst us. We have many, many animals amongst us that we've never heard about. And they're adapted to live in the heat and the dust and the humidity and the cold and all the kind of temperature and ecosystem niches that India has. So my first word to describe wild and willful is Indian. My second word would be wonderful because I think animals are wonderful. They, they are very clever in the way they live their lives. Their lives are not easy. It's not easy to be a wild animal and survive uh, and find food and find refuge and find mates. And the third word would be human. 
because animals, uh, stories of animals are also stories of people. It's about how we uh, view the tiger, for example. It is about how we make space for animals in our life. And uh, we cannot save animals without uh, the people getting involved. Thank you. Interesting. Now, from the book, it is evident that you have had uh, some unique and interesting encounters with animals. Uh, whether it is the mongoose for whom you have uh, dedicated this book or the uh, uh, monkeys who you say people tend to dislike so much maybe because they hold mirrors to human behavior or the uh, encounter with the crocodile whom you call the pinnacle of a predator. But which is the interaction that sparked you to write this book? Uh, so... When I was a little girl, I would read books or I would be out in my garden and there was a little mongoose there uh, who was very friendly with me, uh, but he would always run away when the adults came. So it was like a secret friendship that the adults didn't know about and that's what interested me in animal behavior. And I study animal behavior now. Uh, and there are many disciplines, it's called ethology or you know uh, ecology. Um, I'm interested to know how they live their lives. I'm interested to know what challenges animals have. And um, they lead lives that are very ferocious, but also lives that are very tender. Uh, they take care of each other. They um, manage to uh, survive in an often harsh climate change um, atmosphere. And I'm, I want to know how they're able to manage. And I think if I am interested in India, as a student of India, uh, not just the politics and the culture, but also the biodiversity, the behavior of animals, the behavior of people, all of this interests me. And it started with that little mongoose in my garden. To whom this book has been dedicated. <laughs> Thank you. Now, this book describes uh, 15 iconic and very interesting species, Indian species. But which is your favorite and why? My favorite is the leopard because um, we have a lot of leopards in India, maybe about 18,000 leopards. But uh, I feel they're not um, as well known as tigers. And I feel people give names to tigers. So there was Avni the tigress, there was Machli the tigress, uh, Kolarwali the tigress. But leopards somehow, uh, we don't give them names. We tend to kind of ignore them. But also leopards are amazing survivors. In many ways, we talk about how people have difficulties in surviving. Uh, people survive many things, you know, whether it's a riot, whether it's a natural calamity or just a difficult stage. We talk about surviving the pandemic, for example. But leopards, I find, are also great survivors. So you have leopards in Bombay, you have leopards in Delhi, in Guwahati, uh, and in all kinds of habitats all over India. And uh, I just find that fascinating that you have an animal that just melts into the shadows and it lives near you. You don't even get to know it's there. And it's like a ghost um, that, th that's near you and it's very quiet. It's, it's a perfect predator and it's very well adapted to live amongst us. So I think that's fascinating and that's my favorite. Okay. Uh, talking about leopards, you have compared the extinction of leopards to the squashing of the uh, cockroach. Now, why is this kind of a disparity in the mind of the people when leopard is as beautiful as the tiger, but leopards are feared, whereas tigers are revered and uh, we have so many rules and uh, things to like, you know, save tigers, but not for leopards. Why do you think so? I think the answer is in our history. So in the 1970s, India made the Project Tiger, which was an iconic program to save tiger reserves. So we had Corbett Tiger Reserve, and today we have 53 tiger reserves, which is an amazing feat for a country like India, which has so many development challenges, so many people, so many issues of livelihood. Uh, so we have this incredible program that's centrally sponsored by the government for the tiger, but we haven't had that yet 
for the leopard or for many other species that need it. So it's up to this generation now, my generation and that generation, to make these animals and their needs count a bit more. So what we've done for tigers is inspiring and it's very important, but we also need to do it for a few more species, including the dolphin, the Ganges River dolphin, which I write about. Uh, we need more work. So hopefully, uh, by the end of my life, we'll have a few more uh, centrally sponsored schemes for more Indian animals. Definitely hope and pray that the same will happen. You have written in your book that you wrote this book in the span of one year. But uh, after reading it, I see that it is filled with anecdotes and experiences from starting from your childhood to your adulthood. So how much time did it actually take you to plan, process, and complete it? So I write columns in newspapers, and usually I have to do everything in one day But uh, when I'm writing my columns. But writing a book takes longer. So yes, it took me one year to write it. But I have been, my research for the last 10 years is in this book. But even before that, I used to think about, uh, you know, wildlife and just the things that interested me. And I want to tell the students here that whatever your passion or obsession is, it would be really helpful if we could just write down like a couple of bullet points on whatever your passionate about whenever it strikes you, whenever an idea strikes you, if you write it down, uh, by the time you are coming out of school, by the time you're done with your 11th and 12th, you would have, you know, many interesting ideas and points. And maybe one day you're going to make a reel or a blog or write a book. And I used to write a diary. And um, I still write by hand. Uh, I write by hand first. And uh, just jotting down some of those ideas have helped the book. At the time that I was jotting them down, I didn't know that Wild and Willful was not in my head. But uh, it really helped. So I mean, anybody, whatever they care about, we should make it a point to write it down somewhere, anywhere, on, on a tablet or a, or a computer or a diary, wherever. And maybe one day it becomes an amazing piece of art for the world to see. Thank you. I'm sure the students are taking down the step of uh, maintaining a journal, which will help them in the long run. You have an entire section uh, in your book devoted to butterflies. How do you think these small insects weigh against the mammoth tuskers, tigers, leopards, or even snakes for that matter? So the reason I have butterflies in this book is because I think tiny things are very beautiful. Tiny things are also very fragile. Uh, butterflies are an indicator of climate change because butterflies need flowers, but they also need puddles of water. That's how they drink water. And places that are becoming more dry and more hot are not able to sustain butterflies. And therefore, butterflies are the first indicator of global warming. And a lot of butterflies are now migrating to different parts of the earth because they cannot stand uh, the changes in temperature in many places. Places. And when we see a butterfly, we, we, we think about gardens and we think about nursery rhymes and probably it's one of the first animals we ever drew as children. We would make the, you know, the garden flowers and the butterflies. But the butterfly is also a wild animal. It's an animal that does very long migrations. Some butterfly species will migrate from North to South America or from, you know, Eastern Ghats to Western Ghats in India or from Rajasthan to Delhi where I live. And I think that's just amazing because it's a tiny insect. How does it survive storms and tornadoes? And how does it survive cities? But it does. It does and it lives amongst us. And um, it's also as wild and as willful as a leopard or a tiger. And I think that's very inspiring. Interesting. Moving on from butterflies to elephants. You had written about your visit to the Toda tribal community and uh, how the Toda tribal woman does not live in terror of the elephant in her garden. She exists instead in a place of understanding, taking cues from both tuskers and trees. 
can you tell us something more about tribal life and their coexistence with the wildlife? I wish some of the students could have come to the sessions yesterday where there was a lot of talk of the politics of India and the different demographics of India. But we have a rich tribal population and generally speaking, they have what we call traditional ecological knowledge, which basically means that they have systems of information which are derived from nature. So whether it's medicine, whether it's, uh, you know, understanding what flowers and fruits at different points of the year, what time animals migrate, what are the seasons when you will have elephants amongst you and you won't have elephants amongst you. So it's kind of like a life that is in tune with nature around them. And uh, I'm very interested in the way they use language. So when I speak to many tribal people, and we have gones in this book, apart from Toda's, Toda tribals, uh, they refer to the elephant as who and not as a what. So in Hindi or in English, you may say, if you see an animal, you'd be like, what is it? But for a Toda tribal, it's usually who is it? They're giving personhood to the animal because they respect the animal. And I think that's fascinating to give almost a human personhood to a non-human uh, is giving it a kind of right and respect, which uh, you know conservationists like me can only dream of. I think we should learn from them. We should also learn Absolutely. to coexist with all the animals. Thank you. Now, Neha, to further the tip that you gave about maintaining a journal, what other tips would you give our young audience here, the budding authors? So, I was not always a conservation biologist and I had changed my stream from arts to science and I had to leave India in order to study a science degree because I could not change it in India. Basically, uh, sometimes, you know, we have systems of education or learning which are quite rigid, but I want to tell the students to follow what interests them the most. If you are doing a subject that, you know, is not taught here, find a way to study it anyway. If you like to do something which is a unique profession, you should do it anyway. You need to work hard, of course. It's not easy, but don't give up on what matters to you. And if you're leaving school and you don't know what's, you know, what you want to do for the rest of your life, it's completely fine. You can switch your careers later. As long as you work hard and as long as you uh, follow that passion. I think it's really important to live a life of passion. So I didn't start off as a conservationist, but I did switch my career later. And I also want to say that if we make time in our lives for things that we don't understand, such as animals, it could be computer code, it could be uh, just anything that is a little difficult for us to understand, it's a wonderful thing to still think about, because it's the difficult things, the inscrutable things, the unknowable things that make us also interesting. You should keep your curiosity alive and it will give you a life of happiness and joy and purpose. Thank you, Neha. Keep your curiosity alive. Thank you. Can we now take questions from the students? I think every time I was disobedient, my mom would say, you're so willful, or, you know, she would ask me to obey. And we often think animals are disobedient because they don't do what we expect. Like, tigers will walk into a marketplace, or an elephant will enter a paddy field that's uh, run by a farmer. I think uh, I'm trying to say that being willful, these animals being willful, is not them hurting us. It's just something they're doing to live their lives. And I'm trying to say that it's not just the beautiful, tame animals that we should respect. It should also be the wild animals which do these kind of things um, to live their life. We, we ought to respect them too. So wild and willful is trying to make willful a good word a positive word. I'm not asking you to be disobedient to your parents, but I am saying that if there's something that you disagree with with your parents, maybe you can talk to them about it. Don't give up the idea altogether. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. 
Good morning, ma'am. So I have this question. You can shout. It's okay. I can hear you. So I have this question. So the population is increasing day by day, and uh, we keep on uh, demolishing the animals' habitat. So what is the solution to this? Uh, how can the earth accommodate so many people and still accommodate all the animals? Well, our buildings definitely need to go vertical. Our buildings are very horizontal. We need to go vertical because there isn't enough space actually now. But also it's this generation that needs to make it happen. So uh, I am saying the earth is not ours alone. I am saying that the earth also has tigers and butterflies and dolphins and leopards and great Indian bustard and they deserve to live. They, they deserve to live as much as we do. So all our planning has to be sustainable and there have been, you know, moves in moving towards sustainable development. But I think the simplest answer is to keep everything that lives in that area in the heart while planning. So whether it's a man, a woman, a tiger, a tree, you know, all of it. And it's also worth saying that these guys have been around for millions of years. They were there before, you know, our colonies and Delhi Metro and railway lines, etc. So I think something that's that old, that's that adapted to live in India should also deserve to live. And therefore, our planning has to take their needs into account. It is happening. It's not happening very well, but it does happen. So uh, it needs to happen a bit more. Uh, I'm Heather from 8th grade, again. Uh, your extensive knowledge in wildlife is prominent, and I'm sure you're aware of the movie Zootopia. It is a children's movie, but its prime narrative is the prey versus predator. Are, in your professional uh, opinion, are humans prey to nature or predator? First of all, I think you must be my youngest reader. So thank you for that question. Uh, I think you've answered your own question because you were giving emphasis to humans being predator. We are the predators because in the sense that we uh, control a lot of processes, um, uh, a lot of planning processes that uh, hurt or impact animals. But that also means that we have the power to make change. So I see it as a good thing. There's no doubt we are absolutely on top of the food chain. Uh, even if you're vegetarian, you're on top of the food chain because you're using products that have, you know, impacted environment in some way. But because we are on top, we have the power to make positive change. And that is what I hope that we can do. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Alakya. I'm from class 8. And I've noticed that your book is a very thought-provoking book. So what was running through your head as you wrote this through a span of one year? And also, if you had any pets, did that actually have to do anything with your book? Yes, I have a pet. And my pet is a German Shepherd and he was like a co-writer for this book because I wrote it during the pandemic. I couldn't go out bird watching and my pet was sitting next to me and was very helpful. He's like a wolf. So, uh, I mean, what was running through my mind is I want the animals to be like characters. So you read books in which people are characters. So there's a good guy, bad guy, whatever. So here I'm trying to make the animals into the characters and I hope that's interesting enough for people to read and also maybe like the animal. So my secret hope is that people love animals after reading this book and find them interesting and worthy and um, you know worth uh, looking out for. And I, I would love it if you looked out of your window to see the bird or the butterfly that comes there after reading Wild and Willful. Thank you. Hi, ma'am. My name is Arush from class 7A. Do you really believe that animals, they can take their wings, paws, hands, can they really climb out of the deep, cruel hole that we have dug for them? Can they really do? Also, can we change our ways? Can we become good? Instead of being a predator, 
which can only hunt for food, we hunt for both food, but we also hunt for pleasure. Many of these poachers, they just mindlessly kill just for the fun and the thrill of the hunt. Do you really believe that we can, we can become good, we can help work together, coexist with these animals? Thank you. Uh, I write, in this book, there's a chapter on a bird called Amur falcons. They come from Siberia to India, and then they go to Africa every year. And people were hunting them for food and also for fun in Nagaland. And we did a conservation project there. And we told them, you want to have fun, and there aren't many things to do in this place, because it's a very remote place, a mountainous place. So we did a football match instead. We found a village with a football with a ground that we converted into a football ground. And we did a football match and we gave them a trophy in the shape of an Amur falcon. What I'm trying to say is, uh, I don't shame poachers or hunters for killing animals. What I would like to say to them instead is, we can find ways to have fun that don't kill wild animals. Because wild animals are threatened by many processes, including climate change, habitat loss, etc. So let's have fun without killing animals. It's possible. We can do sports, we can, do, we can write video game scripts together, we can go on nature walks. And uh, in fact, there's somebody here in the audience called Arvind who has a YouTube channel. Arvind, can you put your hand up if you're there? Yeah, hi. So he has a YouTube channel and he talks about uh, how you can go on bird walks and bird trails. So you can move from the catapult, which is used to kill a bird, to the camera which in which you're just capturing the photograph but not capturing the real bird. So you can still have fun without killing the animal or the bird. And it's being done all over and I hope more people do it. Thank you for the question. Fabulous question. Thank you. We have, um, we're running out, we've run out of time. So if we can take this Chris. First of all, hello, mom. Um, actually, uh, I've read Wild and Willful when I was like a fifth grader, and it's one of the first books I've actually read uh, based on uh, like someone who's an activist and who's actually working to make the world a better place. This book has given me quite a bit of insight on thinking what uh, activism really means. But the important question, uh, the question that I wanted to ask is, the, wo the one word that you were asked to describe this book was Indian, because it mostly focuses on Indian culture, but we have, like, in the society that we live now, right? So if you're an Indian kid, the one dream that you might have is to go to USA, become successful there, and settle down there, and know everything about USA, and then just abandon India. It's just a small thing that's in our society and used a lot, of, uh, a lot right now. So my question is, why should we care about Indian culture? Though it's not, I'm not trying to contradict with anything, but why should we care about Indian culture and um, and like, like we care about other cultures a lot, right? And like if you take a time to think about the most successful people out there, first, my, not necessarily, but the first person would come like Elon Musk or any other person who's worked in the USA. Uh, but there are Indian successful people out there who are leading the world also right now. But why should we care about Indian animals so much that uh, because your book is entirely based on the activism for Indian As compared to the other endangering animals out there? First of all, because I am Indian and I care about India. And um, I've seen the Lion King and I've seen the African animals. And Lion King has the giraffe and the, the um, uh, lion, which is actually an African species. But over here, we have the Asian lion. We don't have the giraffe here. We have the tiger, which is an Asian species. And 70% of the world tiger population is in India. So I care about Indian animals because I'm Indian. But I also think that they haven't been represented enough. Probably the reason why we know about other cultures is because they have long histories of books and movies. And Hollywood is such a big force in the world. But the India that I dream of, is in India where we know who we are and we value what we have, whether it's our culture, whether it's our wildlife, our languages, our books, you know, books in different languages as well. And 
I, I think it's very interesting to be Indian. And also you have these Indian administrative service officers sitting in the audience in the front row. We could also ask them why did they choose to remain in this country and not go and have illustrious careers in other countries. I think the reason is because we want to do something for our own country. I, we all have the choice of going abroad, but I would ask you to stay here. And I think this is a fascinating country. Thank you. I'm so sorry for running over time. Your answers were wild and willful, obviously. Thank you, Neha, for that insight you. on your book and about Indian culture. So to wrap up, what is very clear in Neha's book, Wild and Willful, is that, and I quote, in this habitat, the outsider is neither the animal nor the human. The outsider is the idea that either can live without the other's consent. This is indeed a wake-up call. Thank you so much, Neha. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, both of you. Um, I would request Dr. Chandramali and Ms. Priyamvada to come on stage. and present our wonderful author and our equally wonderful moderator with tokens of our love and appreciation. Oh, the bouquets and the paintings are simply gorgeous. Thank you, Ria. Thank you, Sudhakar. Thank you. Thank you.